Okay, so welcome to everybody and uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this open lesson organized within the Digital Co uh, Communication Management course or our Master Degree in Strategic Communication. I am very pleased to introduce to you our guest speakers, Marianna Ghirlanda, she is Head of Creative Partnerships in, uh, at Google, and Luca Bistrattin, Creative Specialist at Google. I had the opportunity to listen to Marianna speaking two years ago, and it was an inspiring and stimulating experience, so I'm very thankful for having you here. And today we uh, will talk about uh, online brand experience, uh, digital scenarios, uh, data dream and strategy. Uh, so I want to leave the stage to our guest speaker and uh, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you for inviting us and uh, are they allowed to make questions? Yeah. Okay, so you are allowed to make questions if you want. Let's keep the session interactive and uh, please use our time as is best for you. And uh, I will start this, uh, telling to you something about uh, our uh, Google that I'm sure that you don't know anything about. Do you know who's Google? How many of you made a, a search on our uh, search engine uh, in, the next, uh, in the last hour? Okay, good. Uh, how many of you watched a, a YouTube video today? Hmm, we can improve this one. Eh? And how many of you watched the video in the last on YouTube in the last 24 hours? Cool. There is still somebody that didn't raise their, their hand. Uh, so uh, I will tell you something about Google to give you a, best, uh, a better understanding on our business model. So not only on the user from a user point of view, but also for, uh, from a brand point of view. I will briefly introduce the market scenario and then I will tell you what's my job. Not easy to explain to my mom. And uh, hopefully it will be easier with you. And then I will uh, let uh, Luca uh, tell you about something that I feel is the most important trend in the online communication that is the data driven creativity that I'm sure that now is a trend and when we, you will be uh, working in the closer future will be something that you will have to deal with for sure because it, was going, it will be the um, ongoing process to make creativity. So let's start with Google that you all uh, know and there's uh, a wonderful mission that is uh, making information available to everybody so use our search engine uh, you already know but something that is even better uh, the mission of Google now is uh, uh, making the world a better place and of course this is a very nice mission to ask people to work until late and to give all their energy uh, for the company it works very well but Google now is, of course, a part of a big ecosystem that is called Alphabet. How many of you know what Alphabet is or heard about Alphabet before? It's a, a big holding that includes Google and everything else. Because uh, uh, at one point there was Google, the company, doing weird things. Because I don't know if you heard that uh, we have uh, machine, self-driving machines, self-driving cars, sorry. We have uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, machine. We have many things happening. And so in order to have uh, everything together that could not fit under the brand Google, uh, we have a new brand now that is called Alphabet. That is very cool. And everything started in a garage, so if you have any startup idea, please uh, first think uh, rent a garage, because uh, it seems to be qu quite good luck. And uh, from there, they invented this machine that was the first uh, search engine. It was the first uh, search engine ever that worked uh, in the way how Google works. And actually, uh, many other brands try to do something similar, but it's probably the one that is still working better. And uh, it's still uh, working better because uh, it changed a lot. Something that may, from my point of view, but actually something that makes Google uh, uh, still growing and growing and made uh, the luck, the success of this tool 
is that Google has been going on uh, investing and innovating uh, on the core business. Until now, we still have 150 new releases of the search engine every year. So this means that there are a lot of engineers working uh, again and again on the search engine. And if you think about uh, probably how many years have you been on the internet? Probably at least uh, 10, more or less. Eight, ten, I don't know, you look so young. But um, uh, probably you used the, the search engine all through these years and you saw that the search engine changed a lot. This was probably the first, uh, the second interface that is very similar anyway to uh, what we have now. But if you think about uh, all the ecosystem that is around, now that we the search engine, you could, could get uh, maps, uh, information, it's all integrated. And uh, we have the knowledge graph, that's probably in the, in the next slide. And why it changed? Because when it was born, the search engine had the only objective to drive people away. It's the first website ever that was not trying to keep the people on the, the web page. Because the business of Google that you all know? No? Anybody know how the business of Google of the search engine works? Basically, when we make a research, a search on the engine, like this one, we have this, and that is, uh, it's in Italian, this um, otherwise would be ad advertising. That is something that uh, the advertiser pay, but the advertiser pays only if I click. So now they paid. <laughs> and uh, only with the click. So for Google, what is important is to have people going away from the search engine because it's the only way that somebody pays for, some, for anything. Because otherwise, when we uh, browse the internet via Google, like if I click here, I don't pay anything, the Adidas doesn't pay anything, and so it's all for free. And this is a user service. So basically, all these ads are the only source of revenue of the search engine, but I tell you it's quite a big source of revenue because they work very well, and uh, uh, the advertiser pays only when the user click and goes on the page. So it's the first website ever having uh, uh, the, the objective to have people going away from the page. And this worked until we had the mobile experience. Because when you get to a mobile experience, uh, now it's slightly different because the bandwidth we have, uh, that is available, the internet bandwidth, the internet connection is better, and uh, the contract we have uh, with our carriers, like Vodafone Team or uh, Three, uh, are done in the way that we can use the internet, we can serve the internet without spending too much. But uh, when the mobile was the first, uh, was first uh, used to browse the internet, the data process was very, very expensive. And so basically Google tries, tried through the knowledge graph to give you the answer within the first uh, uh, page. If you are looking for something, and uh, through the knowledge graph, that is what on the desktop you see on the right, on the right uh, here, this is the knowledge graph. So there are the main information about Adidas. If you're looking for, like, let, let's say that the 80% of researches uh, are looking for this kind of information. So you see them immediately, you don't need to click, and uh, you save uh, data and connection and money. So, What's next? How do you know, what do you know about big data? Please say something. We don't sell any data. No. We don't sell any data because it's forbidden by the law. Because otherwise we could potentially sell uh, uh, your data. Would you be happy if somebody sell uh, your personal data to other companies? No. So big data is a different way of treating data. Uh, and uh, about 
data policy is something that we use on our platform, but in a way that is not ever shared with anybody or any other company. So if you are a company that wants to use our data to make a targeting or, a, or an advertising, you give us the piece of content you want to distribute and we do it for you to the right people, but we don't give you the data of the people. But even we that are working on the advertising side of the company, we don't see the data. We don't have access to anything, any raw data, any personal data. And we can access a statistic only if the number is enough relevant not to be connected to a real people. But this to tell you that uh, data are very precious, very important, and they are a lot. They are big. Big data. Big data, why? Because there was a technology that was putting all together these data that was called, I don't even know the English for, probably it's relational. It was something very technical that was putting together data in a structured way, in a database. But at one point, the data were so many that it was not possible to put all this data within this technology. So has been invented by Google and another company that is Yahoo, a new technology that uh, it's a new way of putting data in relation one with another, and it's called big data. And this changed quite a lot the way we use the internet and we all use all the information. And we can use this data in order to create uh, a content experience that are more relevant for our public. And then Luca will tell you how. In the meantime, I just remember you that we are the best and the biggest company ever, just you to know. You know, is uh, we have, uh, I don't know, one, two, three, four, seven platform that has more than one billion users. And uh, this is really big, but uh, what we are waiting for is the next. Uh, uh, because uh, when we think about internet, we have the feeling that everybody in the world is connected, but actually it's not like this. We still have a big part of population that is not. So this is something that uh, is going to be uh, very soon uh, the internet will get to everybody and together with other tech companies, Google is making a big effort to make uh, internet uh, and uh, connection available to everybody through different devices that are very cheap and can be used in a part of the world. Google today is huge. We are 55 employees and uh, in Italy, we are uh, more or less 200. 200 people doing what? What do you think we do? We are sales. We are a sales unit. And what do we sell? Books. Data. No, data, we already said, no, she thought that we are selling data, but as a side business, we can open it. Information, no, because information available and free for everybody on the internet. Advertising, who said advertising? Cool, we, say, we sell advertising on all, sorry, on all these properties. And so the business model of Google is based on advertising. Now we have other tools and other products but are, very, are still very, very small that are like uh, movies on uh, Google Play, that are Google Cloud that sell services to um, companies. But the big part of the revenue of Google is advertising. I told you about the business model on the search engine, a few words about the business model on YouTube. Do you know who this guy is? Now you are too old to know him. Uh, probably I, ch I picked uh, the wrong one. He's a YouTuber. You all know about uh, who YouTubers are. Okay. How many of you are su subscribed at least to one channel of a YouTuber? Cool. Uh, I'm so curious to know who, but I cannot ask you because you are too many. Afterwards, I will ask uh, to somebody to tell me who is uh, your favorite YouTuber because I'm very interested in. But uh, how do you think that they earn money? Advertising? Advertising, because I hear often uh, a YouTuber earns money about how many likes he has uh, on the videos, no? Not views, because I can have uh, four million views on a video that was not eligible to have advertising and I will get money. 
if I have a video on my channel uh, that is eligible to have advertising, this means that there's not bad words, there's no nude, there's, it's, the, the, the content is brand safe. On, in this case, YouTube puts advertising in front of the video and uh, the earning, the revenue of this advertising is shared half and half between Google, YouTube, and the YouTuber. Actually, it's 54% for the YouTuber and 46% for the advertiser, for Google. <coughs> so this is the only way that they get money. And this works for YouTuber, but works also for broadcasters, for everybody that create content for the platform. So from professional producers until the single YouTuber making just gaming or things like this. So, uh, still about Google, but it's, I hope it's the last slide I show you about this. Uh, this is uh, all the products uh, we have. They are quite complex and uh, they involve the, it's all basically about advertising, uh, almost. This is hardware, Chromebook, you know, we have um, telephones and blah, blah, but this, is a very nice area that Luca is talking about. Luca works for double click and uh, he will tell you about the programmatic advertising that I think is going to be probably the future for the next 10 years at least. After 10 years you have to find another job, sorry. It's so, so quick. So let's see how is the digital landscape, not only Google, about a bit more uh, uh, wider. First of all, if I want to talk to you, that probably are just a bit older than these guys, the only way I can do it uh, is through the mobile. So, and this is quite challenging. Sorry. It's quite challenging, but it's for everybody. How many times per day do you think that maybe you lost your mobile and you touch yourself? Where did they put it? So it's kind of a syndrome. Me, I look for my mobile even, even, even when I'm talking to the mobile. Am I on the phone with somebody and they say, where is my phone? So this is quite, uh, and we, when we don't have internet connection, we get crazy. Everybody says, no, I travel by train uh, rather than uh, airplane because so I can uh, browse the internet during the trip. But going to US is a bit complicated anyways. So what's happening now is that we don't go online. Because until a couple of years ago, we had the target of people online. But actually, is everybody online? We are online, we are always connected. And now I'm, I would like to check my WhatsApp because it's quite difficult for me to stay so long without checking if everything is okay. So we are always connected. And I show you a video that explains to you how many chance we have to talk to our users. how many opportunities online are for brands and advertisers. 
There are many times uh, in our days that we are looking for something that we would like to buy or a service that we need. And uh, being there in that moment uh, is quite important for a brand. And these opportunities uh, are often missed. Are often missed and think about uh, all these opportunity, how many touch point. Why I say we are always online and we don't go online because we are always connected to one of these uh, devices that are getting more and more. We always uh, we go on think, talking about, uh, uh, I should uh, actually add it uh, here, the uh, Internet of Things. At home, I have this device that we've been talking about uh, while coming here that is called Google Home that my kids used to talk to. So they wake up and they ask, Google Home, play some music for me. Google Home, uh, what's the weather today? Google Home, they're learning English because they speak English. So it's quite good. But it's something that is really always present uh, in our uh, days. So why is this relevant? This is relevant because uh, it's changing very quickly and uh, either uh, we follow the change and we are able to innovate and we are there in the changing, either we lose uh, the match. I don't know how many of you remember of Kodak. How many? You are too young? No, you are not too young. Very good. When I was uh, your age, Kodak was for sure uh, one of the first 10 brands, probably, and it was for sure one of the first three in the photography area. And uh, they were sure that digital photography would never take the place uh, of the analogic one, because photography is an art, because uh, analogic was much better than digital, and because digital, in their mind, would never uh, get to the level of the analogic one. As you can see, on our daily life, nobody would ever use an analogic camera anymore. So, somebody else had, uh, when I was a Nokia user, I had a Nokia that was a 31st uh, 10, and uh, I was going on saying to everybody, I will never change. I will use Nokia forever in my life because it's the best. And they had uh, an operation system that was called Symbian that was uh, in the pockets uh, of the 60 or 70% of the mobile users. And instead of innovating on their operation system that was like for Google, the search engine, they tried to find uh, a new operation system to use uh, on the smartphones. And in this change, they lost uh, their position. And this was quite a mistake, I would say. Last one, but not least, after the Nokia 3110, I moved to BlackBerry. And I found that BlackBerry was the best telephone ever. Because I would say to everybody, no, I cannot use a touchscreen um, keyboard. It's impossible. The BlackBerry keyboard will not disappear ever. And you see, anybody has ever seen a BlackBerry in the last year? No. So, innovating, innovation, taking care of the trends and having a, a looking around is very important. It's very important for brands, but it's very important for people. We all are brands ourselves. I will leave uh, uh, the presentation to you so you can have uh, a look to uh, let for you a few statistics that are run by um, uh, research that uh, we are social. How many of you know we are social? Okay, it's an agency and uh, it's probably one of the first uh, digital agency in Italy and they are present, uh, they, it's a multinational and uh, they run uh, this uh, research on the international that I find is one of the most uh, complete and the better one and I just leave you with uh, the first uh, uh, search website uh, on the um, search engine as you see, people search for Google on Google. It's quite weird, but it's true. And uh, just uh, <laughs> is the way it is. And uh, so this is quite important to have an overview on about what people, uh, where people spend their time online. And something else that I want to highlight before leaving you is that uh, here, is that uh, if you think uh, about uh, social media, that is one of the questions. You know, how many properties do I have to use online? Which are the most used social media? Of course, uh, 
we all know that the best, uh, the, the main social media as a social media platform is for sure Facebook, even if it's losing uh, all over the world. In Italy, Facebook is, is losing less users than the rest of the world because we still like Facebook quite a lot. But if I have to say, if you need to work on a project and if you have to identify which are the touch point in the social media area, I will say YouTube, Facebook and Instagram are probably the only three that uh, are worth to be used and that you cannot ignore in this moment. I don't know what's going to happen. For sure, Twitter uh, is gone. Uh, WhatsApp uh, is huge, is incredible, but still uh, is not really clear how we can use to communicate uh, on a broad uh, level so it's still a question mark and these are the touch points that you cannot avoid and uh, i would say that i will hand over to you for data driven creativity now and i will take so i, I make a pause because i'm Whenever you like Marianne. thank you and uh, then i go back with the second part of my presentation also because so you have all the time you need, because I think that this part is more important than mine. Okay, hi guys, I, I am Luca, my name is Luca, and I work on DoubleClick, okay? DoubleClick is uh, one of the pieces of product that uh, uh, Mariana showed us before in the, that complex chart, and the purpose of DoubleClick is to enable digital advertising outside the so-called world garden that Google is, okay? Not only Google, but I say the biggest player are, okay? Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, whatever, okay? So the way we call this approach of advertising is called programmatic buying. Have you ever heard about this? Okay, perfect, I, I was expecting this, so I tried to put some, some kind of recap no, before going down to creatives and down to data driven creatives. So the, the base of everything we're gonna see uh, from now on is the fact that we are living the big data explosion, okay? So that's something you already mentioned, but just to, uh, to make it more clear, in one minute of internet, uh, we have these numbers of interaction from all the user all around the world, okay? So that means uh, 50,000 apps are downloaded, uh, more than 1,000 Uber rides are uh, booked, 400 videos are uploaded on YouTube, 200K uh, dollars are sold in value on, uh, on Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just talking about one minute, okay? So we have 60 times for, for, for get to an hour, all this number, and we have 60 times 24 to get for one day. Okay, so imagine how many uh, digits these numbers would have if we talk about a full year or a month or whatever, okay? So apart from this, which is uh, uh, pretty interesting by itself, what we see, what we are experiencing is that the speed where, uh, with which products are coming in our hands and the people start using it is uh, accelerating dramatically, okay? So, Let's try to consider this. The telephone took 25 years, uh, 75 years, sorry, to get to 50 million users all around the globe, okay? 75. The radio took more or less half to the time, 38 years. Television took 13 years, okay? If we go and talk about Angry Birds, it took 35 <laughs> days, okay? So this is just a... And this much more relevant. <laughs> And this changes our lives much more than, uh, than <laughs> telephone program. No, not mine. I've never downloaded Angry Boards. Uh, it's true. It's all this time. <laughs> um, so looking at these charts, this number, we figure immediately out that we need to be at a much faster pace to be at the same time and in line with the world is changing and is making changing and is moving, okay? And this was just to mention some. As we said already, we are living online and that's the reason why the online world is moving so fast and is giving, uh, getting so much relevancy in our lives with uh, nomophobia, et cetera, et cetera. And also, if you think about this number, 55 times per day is the times that on average we check our mobile devices every day on average all around the world, okay? 150 times, that means eight times an hour 
something like that, if we don't sleep. Okay, otherwise 16. So I, I will leave you all these uh, kind of information so you can check it afterwards and figure out what's behind each one of that. But another thing that we need to realize if we talk about advertising in this era, not only in digital, well, let me say that digital is becoming a big part of it, but uh, not only in digital, but all over uh, the media, is the fact that we were used to have interruption, okay? So while looking at a newspaper, you find the mid-page with, uh, with all the ads. When you look at television in a, a movie or, or even um, in a news, uh, a news channel, you get your interruption once every 15, every 20 minutes, something like that, okay? Now, every, the media consumption is changing dramatically. It's changing also the, the content consumption. And I'm referring explicitly to the way we look at the TV. So how many of you looks mainly the content that they like on TVs, on linear TVs? Not so many, I would say. How many of you use Netflix, YouTube, Spotify, instead of the radio, instead of uh, Rai Uno or whatever, okay? So even Marianna is using more even Netflix. Marianna, <laughs> even old people. <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking. So anyway, this is a, a, very, a very important shift in the concept of how we get to the user through the content that they want to look for, okay? So the people now is just to choose what they want to look at. So they are not buying uh, TV Sorisi Canzoni or whatever to see what's on, on the six main channels in the, in the TV now, but they already built um, their playlist on, uh, on whatever the, the platform they are used to use. And also the platform is suggesting most of the time what is the next thing you're gonna like, okay? Which is a different area. It's machine learning, but it's still strictly related to the way we're gonna consume this content, okay? So, Looking at this number, we see, okay, uh, an, overall, uh, uh, an overall statement, okay, we have uh, 75,000 uploads of video every hour on YouTube, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But when we come down to, to something that marketers need, advertisers want, is getting more and more clear that we need to change the way we think about um, our user tastes, our user um, behavior, et cetera. Because, for example, this is just an example that we, have seen, we are seeing some of them. We have uh, the data um, certified knowledge that online games are collecting more women as an entertainment than Fifty Shades of Grey as a movie in the, in the, in the cinema halls, okay? So if I am a marketer that is willing to address a message to women, okay, maybe women 25, 55, that are going to the cinema, et cetera, et cetera, I may think myself that Fifty Shades of Grey would be an ideal place to get the reach that I need for my new product, for my new service dedicated to women. But at the end of the day, what data is telling us is that online games is probably better, okay? So this is a, a great shift of mentality that the marketer need and are starting now to do, okay? So the concept that is behind that is that I don't have to figure out up front which is the media that is more uh, tailored for that kind of target that I have, for example, women, for example, women with kids or uh, families with uh, adolescent uh, children, etc., etc. But, but I need to let data drive me to that user, okay? Because uh, data is by definition unbiased. That means that our, what we know before looking at the data is not important at that point, okay? So let's look at, at some other example like this. Let's say customer reviews. As a marketer, I may say I don't care about what the, what the customer are reviewing on, uh, on my e-commerce or on some, some third-party e-commerce because uh, I have my base, I have my TV spot that shows uh, my testimonial that is super satisfied of uh, that car wheel brand or whatever, but at the end of the day, what we see from the data is that 75% of the people will look, at least, look at the reviews before purchasing something online, okay? So maybe reviews is the data that I, I need to care a little bit more about, okay? Another, thing, another very interesting thing, another very interesting insight, this chart shows uh, the number of visits to a physical shop, 
okay, a physical dealer that the car buyer takes before buying the car. Okay, so in 2012 it was four times, so he was visiting for the first time the first one. Then maybe changes, maybe he comes back to the to the uh, to the first one he visits, so that he can know more about some features, some may 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 book for a test drive, etc. In 2014 it was three. In 2014 it was two. 2015. So basically now he goes once at the shop. So that means that he goes there just to purchase the car. And let me say that the reason why he's going there is because it's not available online. Okay? So still you can't buy a car online for the moment. There's been some tests on Amazon for Fiat 500 or something like that. So what is the relevance of, uh, of, uh, of the dealer shop in our, in our path to conversion, let's say? Is, is less and less relevant. And the reason is that in such a path to decide if to buy a car or another, there are a lot of touch points. Touch points, I mean mm, information that the people is getting from websites, from physical shops, etc., etc. And uh, they are, we still have 24, 24 touch points and 19 of them are digital. Okay? So if you, they go and see the video of the inside of the car, that's right, taken by somebody else. Uh, speci specialized press that is reviewing that model, that new model, or it compares directly one model with another one. Okay. So coming back about the data, I'm trying to, s to show here some bias and uh, uh, concept that we may all have in mind, more or less. And uh, let's see what data tells uh, tell us about that. For example, start from the new one. Sport is a topic uh, very close to men more than women. Okay? What is data telling us? It is 60% more of sports goods um, uh, that are searched on YouTube are searched by females. Okay? 60 more percent. Gaming is for kids. <laughs> the half of the people who is a, who is a mm, professional, let's say, gamer, is above 35 years old. I mean, the guy he is looks much older either. Huh? But, um, so talking about uh, homemaking, being a housewife, etc., that is something always related to women, most of the time related to women, but at the end of the day, almost the half of home goods are searched by men. Okay? And then, eh, sorry? That's something. Uh, Maybe, but still they are the target. Uh, yeah, but that's are, the, those are, they are the ones that go and buy there and they put the money on the table, okay? So they may be the most interesting thing for the advertiser who is looking for that type of buyer. And then the last one in, that, in my opinion, was the, was the most easy to identify. So men are those who buy cars. That w that's not true. <laughs> More than 60% of searches and information seeking on the web is made by women, okay? So at the end of the day, women buy cars. So that's, that's the point, okay? And this is just a small segment of information that we can gather from the, from the data inside that are super precious for our market, for our advertisers, and that we can address connecting data to the machines that go out and buy banners, video, etc. online. Is there any question about this? Super clear, perfect. So, just to go to one of the main marketers in this type of data-driven approach, which is Netflix, okay? Netflix is building his whole offer around the data that is able to gather from your own behavior, from everything you do on their own platform. The VP and Product Innovation um, Vice President, Todd Yelling, is saying that uh, uh, he doesn't care at all if uh, the guy who is working, who is watching uh, Breaking Bad, is uh, is an old woman, 73 old woman, or the or the guy who is watching Dancing's Mom is a 19 year old guy, uh, a teenager guy. So what is relevant for him is that what what this guy like, okay? So he's super open to target a 70 plus year old woman with the content like Breaking Bad because she showed interest to, with uh, toward that. And to the 90-year-old guy, the dance moms and whatever, whatever series that could be family-oriented, more family-oriented. Okay, so that's 
the base of all the story that we are trying to, to tell today. So the only thing that Netflix think about, care about, is the performance of that investment that is doing on that guy, on that user. Okay? So, wait a second, wait a second. This is... Sorry, it was automatic play. Um, I'm showing you now, to you now this video that uh, is trying to show the potential of uh, the programmatic approach. So what is programmatic by doing? So we talk about the data, the information, the insight, the way that we can shape our strategy um, using the data. And uh, this video shows exactly what is this type of path in this case using double click but double click consider is not the only programmatic player in uh, in the market of course it's a privileged player because it's part of google okay so we are plenty of innovation products uh, uh, data coming from uh, from the other property etc cetera, etc cetera. okay but now we see this video and we talk and we can comment later on Sam. perfect This is Sam. We know from Google data that he's a male. He's 18 to 24 years old and single. And into fitness. We also know he's into traveling. Thanks to this data, we know that Sam is the perfect customer for GoCam's new product. That's why on the way to a cafe, they show him a True View ad. Sam is now aware of the GoCam brand. At the cafe, Sam is browsing a travel blog. Here, GoCam use keyword contextual targeting to show him the most relevant ad for the site. In this case, it's their travel ad. Yes. Sam is now thinking about buying the camera. Yes. Yes. That's it. Go on, Sam. Come on. You can do it. Yes. Yes. Ah. Oh. We say he's still in consideration mode. On his way home, he searches on Google and clicks on the top result. A GoCam search ad. Ooh. Reading the news, Sam sees a display ad for the same camera. Here, GoCam are using search to display remarketing. Can you guess what he does now? Result! He purchases the product. Now, let's break this all down. Cross device reporting means we can see Sam's journey on all his different smart devices. Smart, eh? Looks like Sam loves his new product. But there are some GoCam accessories that could make his videos even more gorgeous. Nice. He's now on his way to becoming a loyal brand customer. And now Sam's got the kit. Next stop, the world. With DoubleClick, you can tell a consumer story across all digital touch points, on all devices, in any environment. less <clears throat> this is what double click is trying to do okay so put the data that we need at, at, at every step of our purchase funnel and try to bring the most of most of the value in an efficient way to the advertiser and to the brand and in this case to the GoCam brand okay they should be very happy about having made this sale because otherwise it would have been impossible probably to get to Sam and to interest him to engage him so just to recap a little bit, I know it's it's very high level, so we could, could stay here and talk about programmatic and all the things that you can do with that for days, and that's what we try to do with our customers most of the time. Uh, but just to remember, so the idea of programmatic is to get to the user where is sensitive to that message, that could be, for example, a geolocation, okay? When it's close to a shop, let's send him the message relevant for that position, for that shop, go to get the user that are interested to that. And that's the example we had before with Sam looking for a camera um, article and then being remarketed, as we say, so then being caught into a list where he got to see the display banner after that is promoting the camera itself. Let's try to do it uh, in the most efficient way, okay, by using all the properties, the, the data, the audiences that uh, Google and WK, WK are able to give to the brand as an as instrument. And 
specifically telling something relevant for the user, okay? So this is the what. So if we think about uh, mass media marketing so far, we've always seen the same advertising being directed and delivered to all the users, more or less all the users, okay? Apart from regional advertisers, but if we think about something nationwide, we think about the same ad for everyone. So when I was uh, uh, at high school, I was coming back from, uh, from lessons, okay, it was uh, lunchtime more or less, and I was getting all ads for uh, moms, you know, housewives, because during the day it's supposed to have housewife looking at television, uh, television or somebody's looking after kids, etc., etc. So, uh, so something that com was completely irrelevant for me. It, it could have been the best ad in the world, super fun, with uh, great actors, great directors, etc. But at the end, I would never go buy diapers or whatever, okay? So the thing with programmatic is that we can also shape the message according to who is looking at that, okay? For the example of Sam, when, uh, when the drone product came in, the drone product was delivered to Sam only because we know, we, uh, the marketer know that he already bought the camera, otherwise, Sending a message of buying a drone for someone who doesn't have the GoCam, it's completely a waste of time, resource, and money. Okay? So that's the whole thing. Talking about the numbers, just to get an idea of, uh, uh, of how um, deep is the penetration of programmatic in the current digital world, in the US and UK, that are by far the most advanced uh, uh, countries, markets in, uh, in this area, 80% of the budget invested in digital will be traded programmatically, programmatically by the end of the year, 80%, okay? While in Italy, we have to be happy with the 40% and let's wait for, for the biggest country to open the, the path. But anyway, we will get to 80% uh, sooner or later because that's what the trend is, okay? So we can, you, you now know that programmatic buying can be the future only or almost only way of buying advertising online. So, it's a, a, which is a mixed connection between message, data, and strategy. And just to complete the picture, when it was born, programmatic was uh, just a way, was uh, perceived by the market as uh, a way of uh, selling something, some inventory, so some, some banners, basically, and some videos that were not traded, were unsold, basically, unsold inventory, okay? So the publisher, let's say Corriere della Sera, uh, they had one million ads that they can show, ads lot, okay? And they sold just half a million, okay? Let's give the other half a million to programmatic so that they, that they can feel what we are unable to sell with our own forces. This was just the beginning and is now is, is taking the evolution. At the moment, you can buy uh, relevant inventory on all type of devices, as Mar Mariana mentioned, so desktop, mobile, tablet, etc., etc. And you can also have adva very advanced tool and feature that you can use to get to the right user. And in the future, okay, what we are starting to see now in some markets, this approach will be extended to television consider the evolution of smart TV connected devices that we are, we are going, almost every one of us sooner or later will have in, in his own home, okay, smart TVs, etc. And on the outdoor and on the radio. The radio, think about the radio as Spotify or digital radios, okay? So target the radio message on that user, on the thing that is just listened to, on what is going to listen to one second after. And the outdoor is basically so uh, the so-called aficioni, let's say, no? So it's not anymore just glue and paper, but we, st we still can see that, that there are some type of displays, uh, etc., that are more and more connected, and we will get to the point similar to that minority report scene when Tom Cruise step into a, a, a mall, let's say, and uh, there is a, a banner that speaks to him, calling him by name, by age, uh, and telling him what he bought last time, etc., okay? So that, hopefully that is not going to happen, but we have to get ready to have, to have some uh, even more and more tailored advertising, even on non-purely digital media, okay? So, 
we have talked about this, so, as the magic formula. Okay, real-time buying, automatization, data, feed digitalization, etc. and boom, we have the magic formula, okay? Everything is done, and, 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 and it's there for us and for all. The thing is that there is something that is missing to the, to the equation here, okay? So, basically, where is creativity, okay? So, where, where the man's talent fits into this picture? Okay? And how can this talent get benefits, collect benefits from uh, this big data eruption, etc., etc. Okay? So, so far, programmatic is always focused on, a, on the mechanism on go and find the person and buy that given spot where the person is looking at at the moment. Okay? But now, from, from, some, from since some year ago, we are seeing that uh, all this architecture is going to be used and is being used also to drive uh, creative, creative messages, okay? And with creative messages, I'm talking explicitly of the copies, uh, the images that we choose, uh, the type of feeling that we give to uh, a given message, the language that we use, etc., etc., etc. Also because at the end of the day, 70% of the performance and the success of a marketing campaign is down to creative, okay? So if we only work on the other 30%, we we'll probably get to the paradox that we are super high and super advanced on the targeting side, but we are ta we are giving we are delivering crappy ads. Okay, so that ads will never convert and they will never be remembered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Can you imagine the consequences? And then the brand would be ah, oh, programmatic doesn't work. Well, that's not that's not exactly the thing. Okay. So. We are trying to educate, so probably Mariana, you are going to talk afterwards with uh, on the, on the creative agency Google relationship. Take your time, but take all your time, because if I think that this is more relevant. Thank you, Mariana. No, okay. I think <laughs> I respect it because it's true. <laughs> uh, so we, we are trying to educate uh, users and uh, creative agencies in this case to think programmatically about creativity. Okay. Right. Which is not easy because data is seen from a pure, pure creative as a cold thing that's staying there and is not giving me any, uh, any additional input, just, it's just constraining me into a place where I'm not supposed to be willing to stay, you know, probably, okay? So that, that's the, the initial, initial situation, so pretty challenging for us. But what we provide to, the, to this user is uh, our tools, okay, within, in this case, the double click stack, but could be anything else, I could, uh, as I tell you before. Um, and these platforms, these products, allow them to build smart creatives using data, okay? And I'm not going into technical details here, okay? Because I don't think it's, a, it's the purpose of this session. If you want, we can take it offline or doing it in, in, a, in, a future, in a future lesson. But we suggest to them three types of strategies, okay? And these strategies are all about personalization, okay? So making that ad personal and relevant, that's the purpose, the purpose. And art, storytelling, decisioning, and the so-called dynamic creative. Have you ever heard about anything about anything like that? Sorry. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Storytelling is particularly performing and good if we talk about the upper side of the, pan the funnel, while let me say that these other two can be used basically all over the funnel. It's, it's up to the strategist in that case to see what is this, the, the strategy, in fact, to use in which moment, okay? But now we go through each one of these and see some example that can, be, can possibly make it more clear. So, storytelling is uh, pretty self-explicative. That means sending and delivering uh, uh, sequential ads to a user, okay? So, if you guys have seen uh, the video number one, the next time you go on the same media, you'll see video number two, and then video number three, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very simple. And th this, is, this strategy, if you think about it, is used in, also in television advertising, no? I always think about uh, Antonio Banderas in Mulino Bianco, no? So, getting a character, putting it there, and um, disclose uh, features and products, in that case from the bakery of Molino Bianco, connected to some uh, 
effects in the life of uh, Antonio Bandera in that, that particular character. Okay? So this is storytelling, it's, uh, very simple. But even if it is a simple, uh, simple strategy, it doesn't mean that it's not performing and it, it, it can't create uh, some uh, relevant engagement with the user. No? So this example I'm bringing here is, uh, is an example about uh, the ABC network, which is uh, a, um, a private American um, video channel, tele television channel, historical also, traditional one, that is owning the, the rights of the Muppets show. And in order to generate awareness around the new show that is coming up and part of the content that is going to be included in the show, they revealed through this sequential messaging ad on YouTube, in this case, they revealed a sub trauma of uh, what is going on in the show. And it's very fun, so I, I want to show you right now. And action. And you can check me out. I mean, I mean check out the Muppets. New series thing. I'm, I'm sorry, can we cut? Can, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Nathan! Hey. Nathan, sweetie! You gotta move. Uh, am I blocking your light? No, it's your butt. It's super distracting. I'm so sorry. No, 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 get oh, out of oh, here! I'm sorry. <laughs> That's it. Just keep walking. Mm -mm -mm. We see the second episode of this. Hey, hey Kermit. Kermit. Oh, hi there, Nathan. How you doing? I'm good. So, uh, this new Muppet show, it's a, it's a behind the scenes show? Yeah, yeah, it's a behind the scenes look at the Muppets, you know, our personal lives, relationships. I <laughs> couldn't do that, no, mm -hmm. no way, especially if I was doing a show with my ex. Piggy is your ex, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we're, we're broken up. You're totally broken up, nothing going on there? Yeah. I just wondering. So that's your that's your scene right there. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty simple. And yeah. Do you, do you want to run it? Do, do you have this memorized already? Good morning. We'll do this later. So you see, this is very very can be very fun if it's done in a smart way. Imagine going to YouTube, uh, for example, for three days in a row and getting an episode as a pre-roll per day, okay? So it's super engaging, it's fun, and definitely generate awareness on the users, okay? The second strategy that we mentioned is the so-called decisioning. What is decisioning? Decisioning means create a set of creatives, that could be videos, could be banners, for example, and serve that creative to a specific segment of users and potential customer. In this example that you see here in the animation, it's very simple. Male runner, we offer them a blue running bag, and a female runner, we offer a pink sh running shoes. Forgive me for this, uh, it's very, very basic, okay? But can be scaled pretty easily and can, and can bring great value to, the, to, that, um, to our advertiser. Just to let you know the way it's built, okay? There is a feed, which is uh, you should imagine as an Excel five, file, okay? Where you state, for example, males 25, 35 uh, active on technology, or if, uh, males 45, 55 active on sports, etc. etc. You have all the segments that you want to address, and in the in the cell nearby, you mm, you paste the ID of the video or the ad that you want to show, okay? So automatically, whenever the user comes to, when you, the user, come to the website and you see the ad, the ad is able to understand who you are, okay, from your, from your cookie pool, from your navigation data, and, uh, and give you, select from, from, from the list of the feed, the right ad for you, the dedicated ad for you, okay? So it's super automated, of course, otherwise it would be impossible. And even here, we have very cool cases to show. This one is another YouTube case. Don't think that we can do it only on YouTube, okay? We have cases on YouTube because it's part one of our properties. YouTube, but do it on YouTube, okay. And, um, and this is a Netflix case that is about uh, the relaunch of uh, Friends. Do you know the TV series Friends? 
Okay, it was very popular in the 90s. I personally didn't like it that much, but that campaign has been very, very smart in the, in the application. If you want, we can even talk about this after the video, which should be very clear, by the way. Friends was the most iconic show of the 90s. Everyone talked about Rachel's hair. This song. Smelly cat, smelly cat. And Joey's famous pickup line. How you doing? So how does Netflix relaunch a show that finished 10 years ago when people are busy watching lots of other stuff? Introducing the friendly pre-roll campaign. The first pre-roll campaign that is responsive to the videos you're looking for on YouTube. Because no matter what you're watching, there's something in Friends related to it. That's why if you're looking for cute cats, you'll get a pre-roll of Rachel showing off her hairless cat. It's, it's a cat. That is not a cat. If you look for makeup tutorials, you'll get a clip of Joey advertising makeup in Japan. Ichiban, lipstick for men. And if you're looking for dance moves, you'll see Monica and Ross doing their famous dance routine. We tagged thousands of videos with YouTube's top searches, but we didn't stop there. Oh my God! We even created daily pre-rolls in real time related to the world's trending topics. I never seen before. To call me on my cell phone. Helping friends become the it show in France almost 10 years later. All with a simple pre roll campaign. Okay, so it's clear how, is, how this is done. Okay, so basically, Netflix that was owning the rights, bought the rights of friends, generate hundreds, I don't know how many, mini clips of six, 10 seconds, something like that, and uh, uh, grouped search keywords from YouTube, that could be the cats, uh, pets, or whatever kind of interest, um, in clusters, and each cluster has a pre-roll video dedicated to that, okay? So whenever you go to YouTube and you search for something, in that case, you get a relevant bumper ad, as it's called, a short video, before the video you, you wanted explicitly to look at, okay? So this is just to tell you how powerful this type of strategy can be, even if it looks very simple at the end, okay? We now go to the one that looks pretty complex, okay? Which is the dynamic creative. What is dynamic creative? So, dynamic creative is a, a single creative, okay? For example, a banner, okay? Where one or more of the elements that is mm, generating it are changing dynamically according to a signal, okay? The signal could be, for example, the weather, time of the day, whatever, okay? And also the audience that we've seen before, male, female, age, interest in technology or in sports, or in outdoor living or whatever, living in town, living outside the town. So what we do with the same feed that we mentioned before, we can, for example, change the title of, our, of my, uh, the header of my creative. That can say, for example, before 12, good morning, after 12, good afternoon. After 7, 7 p.m., good evening, okay? Very simple one. Or we can change the product that is uh, shown inside the creative itself. So imagine that we are, we are selling smart watches and we know that our user has seen a white watch, okay? I put a white watch in, a, in the cart and he didn't purchase it. We're gonna show inside that product space the white smart watch, okay? Or otherwise, we can change the call to action, so basically the button of, of the ad, according, in this case, to geolocation. So let's say we are in London, and we have different stores in London. One is near Soho, the other one in near Hook or Houston. And uh, according to the position that the user has in that moment, we suggest in the call to action the closest shop with the relevant discount. Okay? And this is these are just examples. So imagine how much you can scale this strategy and make an, a pretty complex feed that include all the type of users and the targeting that you are willing to do, you are strategizing to do, okay? Even for this case, to make it more clear, because I, I realize it's not that clear by itself, we have a studio here, a, a, a case study uh, that it was made by McDonald's in Japan. Uh, and was very, very interesting also uh, considering the 
sources of information that they got, which is very, very smart and very, very relevant with super good performances. Banner ads promote products regardless of when or where you see them, right? For example, how can a routine banner promoting a burger get people in bed to react? What if banner ads recommended what people really want at that very moment and place? We found a hint in cash registers. McNow, the live banner generator combining 2 billion McDonald's sales data and everyday life tracking data to create banners live giving you the perfect recommendation for where and when you see them. We aggregated sales data from cash registers across Japan. We also identified which item was the most popular in a particular place, time of day, weather, temperature, or during certain local events. Then we connected the findings to our smartphone tracking data. Banners and landing pages were automatically generated in real time. And customized recommendations appeared real time. Snacks for people who want to take shelter from a sudden rain. Popular takeout menus on a sunny day. Iced coffee for sleepy businessmen on a morning of a hot summer day. Coke for the thirsty girls on the beach. A hot topic hamburger while it's still hot. More than 25,000 types of banners automatically generated. And we recommended specific items best suited for each person. We distributed digital coupons of the recommended items and drove customers directly to the restaurants. Coupon usage rate shot up 150% over the average. Sales also increased, contributing significantly to McDonald's business performance. We make not only fresh burgers, but fresh ads. McNow. Okay, I take data that McDonald's own, so the actual sales data, to map the country in cells, let's say, and identify per each cell which is the hottest topic in that moment. There may be a reason if, if one is the hottest topic and promote it to increase even more the, even more the adoption. And also linking this to the weather mm, conditions so that you can be relevant and proposing a Coke a fresh Coke when it's very, it's very hot, where it's very hot, and a, a cafe when it's rainy or it's cold or whatever, okay? And this generated 25,000 banners, more or less. So it, was, it would have been physically impossible to do it manually, okay? So this is something even more interesting that we can think about, that whenever you see something, that, when you see an image, there's somebody who's developing that, okay? In this way, we have an engineer, a data scientist, or whatever that is generating 25,000 binary in, at once. Okay. So we were mentioning also offline, okay, and uh, I just wanted to show this very short one. I think it's the short version, I, I guess. Um, which it's only is. 20 minutes. No, no, it's 20 seconds. Um, about British Airways, this is an, um, an out of home ad that has been uh, delivered by British uh, Airways in Piccadilly Circus in uh, London. And it's super, super cool. Airplane from Ethro is passing, is going to pass behind this uh, banner, this uh, billboard. Whatever is on the billboard is stopped, and uh, there is this ad from British Airways that is telling you not only that if a, a plane is physically passing above him, but also where is that frame, uh, flight going to or coming from. Okay, generating, of course, the wheel of traveling of discover which destination you can get. We are in, you are in London, you are close to that. The flight has just, uh, just uh, took off, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And also this uh, campaign won uh, many prizes uh, a few years ago, correct? Yes. Okay. Just a couple of other examples uh, of this strategy. This is something that we've made uh, here uh, from, uh, from Double Click uh, Italy uh, during the Euro 
couple of years ago, one year and a half ago, and uh, this is a smart way of uh, using the data, in this case it's the real data of an offline event, which is a match that is taking place in that moment, and update the user regarding this information and telling him, okay, Italy is winning 2-0 no, or whatever. Okay. Of course, it's not gonna happen in Italy for the next summer because we are not part of the World Cup. So we won't see anything, you won't see anything like that, like that on our media. But that's another way of using data, integrating data, data with the creative and communication. Okay? So no advertising, no business uh, for Google during no, the this next is a big, this Not is only for us, but apparently. Not only for us, it's for the, all the advertising department, yeah. because uh, you know that the budget uh, on uh, all the years uh, is always less uh, than, uh, on, uh, what's the English for it? Anybody. Even. Even, even. even. Even years. Because uh, of the either the um, World Championship, either the European Championship, these are making a big, big budget. So this year for Italy is quite a big uh, mess. We are losing a lot of money. I spoiled my my last slide. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Talking about offline events, the very last thing that I'm gonna show you is uh, this campaign made for um, the Rio Olympics. Okay, which is a very complex structure, but is leveraging exactly this type of strategy to get to the user with the, with the favorite sport, with the favorite sport moment, and suggesting the closest event, the coolest event that is taking part, uh, this is happening in that moment. Consider that during an Olympic, you have like 55 or something different sports, so it's very hard to, to, to understand who is liking what. But, they made it in a pretty smart way, in my opinion. Every couple of years, there's a feeding frenzy that occurs around major international sporting events, like the Olympics. The campaigns that come out on top are those that deliver relevant and engaging experience to just the right users. This is O Brasil Inteiro Joga, or All of Brazil Plays, a project created to celebrate the role of sport in our lives and bring Brazilians closer to the Olympic excitement. YouTube is not working very well. You know. the, the project, project features, features loads of original, of original content, content which, which was, was used, used as the basis for the ads, including 43 mini games, one for each of the sports, and an emoji map showing what was go going on in Rio in real time. In the months before the Olympics, we used programmatic to reach the right users with the most relevant Content content based, based on their, their interests. interests. So, so if, if you're into running, running you'd, you'd see ads, ads promoting the sprint, the sprint relay, relay, or hurdle games, games, which you could play right in the rich media light box ad units. During the Olympics, we used real time data from the Olympic data feed to create hyper relevant ads that followed the action as it happened in the events. And if, if you weren't in Rio, we took it one step further, serving up a cure list of parties and an emoji map which used real-time trends and social data to show the emotional pulse of the city. So we were sure to find the best party to celebrate with the Jamaicans. The campaigns, which ran over eight months, delivered great results at scale. The engagement rate and cost per engagement both beat the benchmark. By creating timely, personalized, data-driven ads and serving them to just the right audience, all of Brazil Plays managed to cut through an intensely crowded landscape and deliver a relevant and engaging experience to all Brazilians. Sketchy, but I guess the sense of the thing is, uh, is there. So thank you very much. This part is finished, okay? I, I always like this, okay? Um, just a, a final note, I'm normally used to talk in front of very critical people who is there to challenge me, to uh, say, oh, this is not working properly, this is not good enough for me, for my brand, etc. And this is the first time I go to the uni to university to speak, and uh, that was great, thank you very much. I think that the time uh, is over and so if you have uh, still a few minutes and if you have any question for me or Luca, is the, you have the chance, so please.
user, like uh, a public computer, because you don't know uh, which type of user. Well, what do you mean as public computer yeah, <laughs> exactly? Ah, the one that is there. Yeah. Okay, so um, of course the cookie pool that you will see there will be a mix up of all the people that is, uh, has used that. I don't know how public computers are used uh, around, I don't think very much, but the thing is that uh, using the login, so if you log in with your Gmail account, your YouTube, your whatever, we can use the same cookies that you have on your personal one and say okay, this uh, user, his name is Clara and whatever. Okay, so yes, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Somehow you can find a way to do it. Other questions? Okay, because uh, they have a task. So uh, they have to write a report in which they have to think critically to your insights in order to try to think how to implement them in a strategic communication, so as a strategic communicator. So thank you so much. I will enjoy so much in reading the reports and maybe I can share with you some, some interesting stimuli. And uh, thank you all, and thank you to our guests for, uh, for this speech, so inspiring. Thank you. So let's see you next week. Thank you, bye.